Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. There's no place else we'd rather be than right here in your house. We give you thanks and praise because you brought us through another year. And for some of us, Lord, there was a lot of bringing through. There were some things that we had brought through. Nobody else knows about you and brought through it, but you brought us through it. And by the grace of Almighty God, we are here this morning. I ask you, Lord, to bless everyone that's in the midst of you because you brought them here for a purpose. They're not just here accidentally. It's not some random chance, but you've laid on their heart to come here, to be in the presence of God. And I thank you, Lord, for that. And I know you have a word for us because your servant, Janae, has been praying to you to get that word, to read the word, to rightly divide the word of truth, that she might give it as you gave it to her. I ask you, Lord, this morning, let the word you have appointed for these people here come forth from our pastor. I ask you, Lord, to bless her in a mighty way. I pray that the sermon blesses her while she's blessing us. I thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in and through us in this church. I thank you for all the young people that are here this morning. They are glorious. They have no idea how beautiful they are. But I thank you, Lord, for bringing them here. And I ask you to bless Miss Beata and the children's church as they go. I ask you, God, to just continue to grow us in grace and in the knowledge of God. We thank you and we praise you. In the master's name of Jesus, amen and thank God. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the church this morning. You may be seated. Is this microphone on? I brought up the hand mic just in case. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. You're on now. I'm on now. You're on now. All right. Normally, on a Sunday, I didn't know what to expect on January 1st. I don't know if anyone stayed up till midnight. No. My family did. This was our first year letting the kids stay up to midnight. And normally, we live... We, we just moved here from Oregon, and normally we can get away with watching the ball drop at 9 p.m., but we couldn't do that this year because apparently it drops at midnight here. But um, So I'm always kind of surprised that people wake up early on January 1st, and there are so many people here at church today. And normally we would have children's church, but I wanted to do a family Sunday this week, and we have so many kids here this week, and so this, this makes me happy. Um, and so I do have over here, Austin has some busy bags that have a coloring sheet and some graham crackers and fruit snacks for all the children, um, because we, I love having children a part of the service. Um, even the older, if anyone wants a busy bag with some graham crackers and fruit snacks, just raise your hand and Austin will, Austin will break you on it. Yeah, don't be shy, there is no age limit on this. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do have a couple announcements before we get started. Um, I'll let you open your grand crackers first. But a couple announcements next week, January 8th, we have a few things going on. First, there is Adult Sunday School that's starting up again January 8th, 9 a.m. in the room down the hall. This is for any adults who, who want to take part in some discussion about the Bible. If you want more information on that, we can tell you more about the content. I've already forgotten what it's on, but it, it's going to be good stuff. And we will also have something available for the kids at 9 a.m. It's what I'm going to be calling craft time. Um, we don't have a plan just yet, but my husband, Austin, and I will be running that at 9 a.m. hoping to do crafts. Um, he's a very crafty guy, and so <laughs> I am excited about that. I'm calling it Kids Craft Time, and we've loved having so many kids here over the month of December. It feels like we have new kids showing up every week, and we want to celebrate that. And so I'm hoping to offer more opportunities for kids throughout the year. Um, I was talking with Lori about maybe going sledding. That would be a fun thing. We can't do that today because <laughs> there is no snow in us. It's a little bit too warm, but that, that sounds like a fun idea. And I also, one of my dreams is I would love, and one of the reasons why I'm doing a family Sunday is I would love to see more kids involved with the church, maybe on the worship team or the, the outreach team or the hospitality team. So that is one of my dreams. I'm hoping to get children plugged into the life of the church, um, just because I think that's exciting. exciting. But also next week, does not say December, January 8th, we're going to have a Connect Deeper seminar after church, and this is a deep dive into our church's structure, finances, beliefs, and what I'm calling our social solidarities, and so this is, previously it would have been called a membership 
class or a membership seminar, but I'm calling it Connect Deeper because you do not have to want to be a member to attend this. Um, it is for anyone who wants to be a member, who wants to join formally. But I also want to stress that you do not formally, you do not have to formally become a member to be a part of our church. The big difference between membership and non-membership is the ability to vote in our annual elections and run for church board. Um, and so there are some things that come with church membership, but I know not everyone wants to become a member, and that's okay. But there will be a light lunch at the seminar, so if you want to attend, please RSVP so we know to prepare for you. Um, and then speaking of church membership and voting, we will be having an annual meeting this year. I know this isn't something that was regularly in the rhythm of this church, uh, but in the manual, we are supposed to have an annual meeting every year, and so we're going to have an annual meeting on February 5th, and this will be immediately after service, but also a part of service, and my hope is to look back at the last year. I wasn't here for the full year, but I'm hoping to look back at the last year and look at everything this church has done, and also look ahead to 2023 and our plans for the upcoming year, and this will also include voting on the new church board. And so as we head into this new year, I also feel like I have a lot of announcements today. Normally I'm like, I need to do just one or two announcements, but I have a lot of announcements. But I also, as we head into this new year, I want, I want to invite you to commit to 21 days of prayer. Um, I'm scheduling from January 8th to January 28th, 21 days of prayer. And this is praying for our community, praying for our church, praying for our church leadership, our upcoming annual meeting, pray for our families, the next generation, the kids, um, pray for our neighborhood through the pray and go. In those 21 days, it doesn't mean you don't pray beyond those 21 days, but these 21 days we want to focus especially on prayer and things like pray and go. I personally am going to plan to be at the church, and so this could look different for everyone, and I don't have specific plans for what this 21 days of prayer will look like other than I want to focus 21 days at the beginning of the new year, specifically for prayer. And so it could look like time spent in the prayer room at our church. Did you know that there's a prayer room? It could look like that. And with the exception of a couple days, I'm hoping to open up the sanctuary and be in the, in the sanctuary from probably noon till one, um, maybe with some music or just some time of quiet contemplation. I don't, I don't want to commit to being up here praying for an hour, but like sitting down, praying, spending time with God, it doesn't have to be hard. Um, and I just want to be a church that begins the year with prayer, to be a church that prays. Um, so let's begin this new year with prayer. And today is New Year's Day. We, we talked about that. But did you know that it's also still the Christmas season? This was something I wasn't raised to know. I, di I didn't know this growing up, but it's still considered the Christmas season today. We are in, if you've ever heard the song, the 12 days of Christmas, today is the 8th day of Christmas. It's the time between December 25th and it goes through January 5th. I don't know, did anyone else know this? Or is this just new to me? Um, but today's scripture reading, I follow this reading plan out there, today's scripture reading continues with the Christmas story, with the story of the Christ child. We heard the birth narratives of Matthew and Luke the past few weeks. And this week, we will continue in Matthew with the unfolding of the gospel. This week, we are picking up in Matthew 2, Matthew 2, 13 through 23. Hear the word of the Lord today. When the Magi had departed... An angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up during the night and took the child and his mother to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophets. I have called my son up out of Egypt. When Herod knew the Magi had fooled him, he grew very angry. He sent soldiers to kill all the children in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding territories who were two years old and younger. 
according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. This fulfilled the words spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and much grieving. Rachel weeping for her children, and she did not want to be comforted, because they were no more. After King Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. Those who are trying to kill the child are dead. Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus ruled over Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he went to the area of Galilee. He settled in a city called Nazareth. So that, so that was what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> There's this story in the Old Testament and some of you might be familiar with it. We talked about it a little during our sermon series on binge reading the Bible. But there's this story in Exodus where the Israelite people, they grew and they grew and they grew. And it angered Pharaoh, the king of the Egyptians. The king had power over the Israelite people. The Israelites were in slavery. They were in bondage. But Pharaoh knew that if these people continued to grow and grow, they might overpower him. And so he got scared, and he started thinking ahead, and he had this archaic idea, and this might not be appropriate for children, the little babies, because if they don't grow up, they can't overpower him. And so he goes to the midwives, Shipra and Pua, and he tells them to kill the baby boys as they're being, as they're being born. It's this evil plan. And the midwives, they knew that it was evil, and they feared God, so they didn't do fascinating but as a pastor and a preacher, I also find myself wondering, what does this story mean for me today? How do I apply this to my life today? What are the practical applications today? What does this matter for me today? Today's scripture reading parallels that Exodus story. Herod feels threatened. He feels threatened by a baby. The news of Jesus' birth has spread, and Herod feels scared. So he sends out a search team to destroy this child, and the baby flees to Egypt. It was similar to the story of Moses' early childhood in the Exodus story. When Moses was born, his mother hid him for three months. After the three months, when he realized he couldn't hide him anymore, she placed him in a basket in the river bend where Pharaoh's daughter found him and raised him and took care of him. Like Jesus, Moses was saved so that he could save others. And Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt as an adult. And here are two stories about horrific crimes of mass genocide. The lives of Moses and Jesus were both spared. With these stories of God's provision and protection, without these stories of God's provision and protection, we wouldn't be here in church. We wouldn't have Jesus to save us if he had died as a little baby, and so God protected him. And there's also this age-old question in the back of my mind. When I think about the mass genocide, I find myself asking, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does a God allow bad things to happen? Why did innocent babies have to die? Where was God's protection and provision for them? And sometimes bad things just happen because there's evil in the world, because we live in a fallen world, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. So what can we learn from today's text? That's what we're going to look at today. And we're beginning a new year, and it's a time of year where a lot of people begin new practices, new resolutions, and one of those, I've seen it all over Facebook with a lot of my pastor friends, is people begin new Bible reading plans. It's a time where people begin these new Bible reading plans where you read the Bible in a year. And so if you want to do one of those plans, if you need a Bible reading plan, I know of many just talk to me after service. There's a couple, they're guided. There's one, it's called the Bible Recap. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, but it comes with a book 
and a podcast, and it takes you through the Bible in a year in a guided way, and it helps you understand the scriptures. There's also the Bible, there's also a Bible reading plan through the Bible Project. I don't know if anyone's heard of the Bible Project, but they do these little videos about the Bible, and they have a Bible reading plan where you can read through the Bible in a year and watch the videos as you go along. And there's this Nazarene pastor and professor in Tampa, Idaho, who's also working on a Bible reading plan where he puts on a new podcast every single day, and he walks you through the theology and the history and the background of each passage. I think he's 90 days into it to get ahead of everyone for the New Year. So if you want to do one of those Bible reading plans, I can I can get you hooked up. Or if you want to do the one I'm doing, there's one out on the Welcome Center. And I will be preaching from that plan also, and I prefer it because it goes at a much slower pace. It goes through the Bible over the course of three years. Um, I'm not as ambitious as some of my friends who go through it in a year. I prefer to go at it at a much slower pace. But as you read the Bible, I want you to write this down. I have a slide for it. It's called SOAP. Have any of you ever heard of SOAP with your Bible reading plan? It's this method of reading the Bible, and so you write down SOAP, you can go to the next slide, and that stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. This is a way of journaling Scripture, so as you're you're reading Scripture, you pull out your journal, and you write down S-O-A-P, and we look at it and say, what is the Scripture? The Scripture is Matthew 2, 13 through 23 today. What is your observation? I observe that Jesus was protected from mass genocide, similar to Moses. That's what I observe. A, application. What is the application? That's the question I'm asking today. What is the application? How can we apply this scripture to our everyday lives? What does it mean for my life, for our life? How is the scripture speaking to me? How is the spirit speaking to you through the scriptures? You would write that down in your journal. And then P is prayer. What is my prayer? My prayer today is, dear Jesus, thank you for your hand of protection and provision. Amen. It's that simple. It's a way of journaling as you read the Bible every day. It's one that I've appreciated because it not only invites you to read scripture, but to look for the application. How can I apply this to my life here today? And as we head into the new year, I've been reflecting on my own life and journey, thinking about the application of the scripture. How do I apply the scripture to my own life? And I was thinking about the scripture and the ways God has offered protection and provision for me. It hasn't always been an easy life. There's been bumps along the way. But as I look back on my own life, I can see the way God has protected and provided me and led me. But can I also confess that I'm a naturally skeptical person? And so this is maybe a little bit of testimony today, but I'm a naturally skeptical person. And so when I hear someone tell me that they heard from God or they, it was revealed to them in a dream to do this, I sometimes find myself wondering, now, did he really, like we're reading the scripture, did he really have that dream? How did he know that it was God? How did he know that God said to move to Egypt and not and it wasn't just that bean burrito he ate the night before that was giving him some some active dreams? How do we know that? Are you are you ever skeptical? Or is it just me alone? Do you ever find yourself skeptical? But in my own life it helps me to write things down or to think about it. Because in my own life, I can reflect back and look and see where God's hand has been there, where God has guided me. And especially as I reflect over this last year, I can see the way that God led me to Camp Soda. It didn't necessarily come to me in a dream where I had this dream where God said, move to Camp Soda because there's a mass genocide and you did and you need to, like, that didn't happen. <laughs> there was no mass genocide. In fact, we were happy in Oregon. We loved Oregon. We loved our family and friends. We had a great church and a great faith family. Oregon is the only place my family has ever known, so it was hard to leave. And so how did I know that God was calling me to Canastota? I would say that it was an easy decision, not because God revealed it to me in a big moment, but because there were a lot of little moments, a lot of little moments leading up to it. I think Pastor Olivia, she gave me time to decide, but I think I told her almost immediately, 
yes, because we had already discussed it. We had already talked about it. I don't even know how else to describe it or explain it. It wasn't like today's scripture. We weren't in danger. We weren't running or hiding from something. It wasn't revealed to me in a dream. But as I look back, I can see that God was at work. I remember in March, I ran into Pastor Olivia at a conference. And she just casually mentioned this church. She mentioned this church that her husband, Dustin, was going to be preaching at. And I remember she said, can of soda? And I said, what, where? And she says, you say it like, can of soda. <laughs> and I find myself still saying it that way. Um, just need to remember to add that T, I guess. Um, but, and it was another month or two after that. I was sitting in a meeting at my lead pastor's house. It was a long-term planning meeting. We were discussing the future, looking ahead five, ten years down the road. And I was sitting in that meeting at his house, and we're talking these long-term plans. And it was during that meeting that I received a text from Pastor Olivia that said, I want to send your resume to this church. And it was just these little moment after moment, these divine moments. Like the, like the way I was able to fly out here and interview during a vacation that I'd already taken time off for. Or the way our house sold in under a week for more than asking and for a lot more than what we had paid. The timing was perfect and it just felt like it was God ordained. I can't even explain it, but I knew that God was calling us here. There was a sign hanging in the sanctuary. It's not hanging there right now because it's, Christmas decorations, but there was a sign hanging in here that said, the will of God will not lead you where the grace of God cannot protect you. I've also heard it said another way that the will of God will not lead you where the grace of God cannot sustain you. And I love that quote, that quote because I think it's true that the will of God will not lead you where the grace of God cannot sustain you. And it's true that sometimes bad things happen to good people or innocent people, like in the story today in the, in the reading plan, but God is our sustainer. God is our protector and our sustainer. And so whenever I think about that question of why do bad things happen to good people, I think about the story of Job. The scriptures say in the beginning of Job, it says that he was a righteous and upright man. But his life was a series of unfortunate events. It was tragedy after tragedy, calamity after calamity. And his friends kept telling him that it was his fault, or that he needed to do this or that, or he shouldn't have done this or that, and that's why he had a bad life. But it wasn't his fault, because the scriptures clearly say that he was a righteous and upright man. It wasn't his fault. His friends were wrong. And there's a scripture in the story of Job where Job says to the Lord, he says, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. The devil, or evil, or chaos, they can all get in our way. They can cause bad things, because we live in a fallen world, and that's why bad things happen. But I love this truth, and the application today is that God's plans cannot be thwarted. They cannot Evil cannot ruin God's plans. Pharaoh was not able to mess up God's plans. God was able to protect Moses. Herod was not able to mess up God's plans. God was able to protect Jesus. And the devil himself is not able to mess up God's plans. God's plans cannot be thwarted. God works in and through the mess to bring about his good purposes. Today, I want to close in two different ways today. In the Nazarene Church, in the Wesleyan tradition or Methodist tradition, there is a thing called the Wesleyan Covenant Service. And I'm not going to do it today, but it began in the 18th century. And it's a service that many churches have at the beginning of the new year. So a January 1st Sunday would be the perfect Sunday to have this covenant service. But it came from the 18th century. And I don't have the updated version of it, but the service, it ends in a prayer. And you might recognize this prayer because if you're paying attention, this prayer was used at the installation service. Pastor Olivia used it 
in the installation service at the end. It was a prayer that I prayed, and I want to invite you as the church to pray this prayer with me. It's a way of renewing our own covenant and commitment to God. And the prayer is, I feel like it's a heavy prayer. It's a heavy commitment. So maybe you're not ready for that type of commitment, but I want to invite you as we close service to pray this prayer with me. The words will be on the screen. But also after this prayer, I want to invite you to come up and receive communion. We have communion here today to start the year, and that's another way of renewing our covenant to Jesus that we made. And so if you could put the slide up there, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. It's the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. And it says, I am no longer my own but yours, Lord. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Jim, could you come up as I pray over this? communion. Lord, we thank you for your protection and provision. We thank you for all that you have done for us to save us, to coming for coming to us as a child, as a baby and a manger, Lord, and the sacrifice that you made through your life. And Lord, we start this new year with many new new covenants, new resolutions, new plans, new plans of action, new prayer initiatives, Lord. And I pray that you will bless it, that you will bless the words that we pray, that you will bless the communion that we take, that you will give, up, that we will yield our hearts to you so that we can be used for your good purposes, Lord. And we give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.